great day to remember. My message today is entitled, Satisfied to Serve. You know, it might surprise some of you to hear about something that you're all familiar with, the term attention deficit disorder. Many of you think your kids or your grandkids have it. Some of you may think that you have it. You may think that it's just something in more recent years that has been diagnosed, but it might surprise you to find out that it was first termed as a diagnosis in 1902 by a British pediatrician. But it became commonplace in the last 30 to 40 years, and it's accepted by people to be a valid diagnosis, and it's estimated that at least 5 million children in the United States have that disorder. It's estimated that 11 million, when you include adults, are afflicted by it. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder is another name sometimes. It has three main characteristics, inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsiveness. And while it's a very real problem, some of you might wonder aloud if you've had it, or maybe you've heard others. I remember a number of years ago, a pastor friend of mine said, you know, he thinks maybe he has attention deficit disorder because every time when he starts to prepare his sermon, he can think of all kinds of other rabbit trails to go off, and I can attest to you that that is true. When you try to come down to what you want to talk about, imagine a term paper if you were in college or any other time, maybe doing your taxes that you want to focus. Attention deficit disorder. We all have trouble with that, don't we? Being impulsive and being distracted. Perhaps if you still can't identify with it, just try to imagine a time when maybe you tried to spend one hour in prayer. If you've never been distracted, try to spend an hour in prayer, and I guarantee you, your mind will think about you forgot to lock the back door, or you forgot to feed the dog this morning, or the blinds are open in the bedroom and you meant to close them to keep the sun. I mean, just every trivial thing. Attention deficit disorder, it affects us. The Apostle Paul cautioned the Philippian church to not get distracted. One of the things he told them not to get distracted by was events of the past. He exhorted them to forget what was behind in that famous passage where he talks about a race, an analogy or a metaphor about a race. He says, forget what's behind and strain and press ahead for the goal or the prize. Anyone who desires to be a Christian and wants to please their Heavenly Father will face many obstacles. In that familiar passage, Paul said in the running a race, one of the obstacles he identified was something that hinders the past in a Christian's progress. It's our memories. It's remembering the past. And I've spoke on this before. This is not the main topic this morning of my message, but one of the things that hinders us in various ways is our memory. Memory of your own past. Perhaps you have trouble forgiving yourself and you're living under perpetual self-condemnation. Even though Romans 8 verses 1 and 2 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Paul goes on later and says, through Christ, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Forgetting what is behind or in the past also involves forgetting and forgiving others. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness of others or what they may have done or how they've harmed you or what they did to you may hinder you. You know, a number of years ago, Pam and I, when our kids were in school, we helped to chaperone four different proms. Junior class always had to take care of all those things, and several times we did the after prom. We chaperoned from midnight till six in the morning on a Saturday night. I want to tell you, still made church, still taught Sunday school. That's difficult to do with two hours sleep. But one of the things that they had at the after prom was great fun. They had a Velcro wall you put on a suit, and the kids would run these inflatable things so nobody would hurt, and they'd run and jump, throw themselves against the wall, and they'd just stick to the wall. Another thing they had was a bungee run. The bungee run was also an inflatable thing, and it was about the length of this center aisle clear to the back. 
and they would put on harnesses and you could strap and hook into to the back wall with a bungee cord and then you could, it had all the slack up here and you'd take off running as far as you could and hard as you could and see what it felt like to get snapped back. And it was quite hilarious to see these people bouncing back. The bigger and the stronger you were, the athletes, they could make it a little further, but they just bounced back all the harder. Well, I'm going to tell you that unforgiveness and bitterness that creeps into our life is a lot like running a race with that bungee cord attached. Unforgiveness of yourself, unforgiveness of others, and bitterness is like running that race with a bungee cord there. No matter how hard or how fast you run, you end up right back where you started. If you're overcome with bitterness, unforgiveness, it's very difficult to grow spiritually. You end up right back where you were. In last week's message, I was preaching from Luke chapter 15 about the prodigal son, that very familiar parable. And I'm going to have you turn with me there today. We're going right back to the same story from Luke chapter 15. Last week I talked about how the prodigal son had repented of his sin and how he appealed to his father and how his father was there looking for him. He kept watch and he forgave the prodigal. He welcomed him. He embraced him with open arms. He gave him forgiveness. He celebrated his return was how the story ended last week. End of the story, right? Jesus could have stopped the story right there with a celebration in verse 24. Luke 15, verse 24. The son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. That's a complete story if you want it to be right there. So that is the end of the story, right? No. There's another son. The older son. The good son. Mr. Dependable. I purposely saved his story for this week because I believe there's much we can learn from him as well. In fact, let's read from Luke 15, beginning verse 25. I'll read through 30. Meanwhile, while this celebration has started, the older son was in the field, and when he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants, and he asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, You kill the fattened calf for him. Can't you just feel the emotion of that older son? It doesn't take a lot of imagination, does it, to understand how and why the faithful son is upset. In fact, he's beyond upset. He's angry. You might say he's honked off. He's really disgusted. And he won't go in and the father even goes outside to meet the older son, to implore him to come in, but he refuses. Imagine what he must have thought when he was coming and approaching the house. No one came to retrieve him from the field and say they're preparing the fattened calf. No one said, come home, take off work early. No, they let him complete his day. He comes home hot and tired and dirty and sweaty, and he hears music and laughter and celebration. All the preparations have already been made. This takes time to butcher the calf and to prepare it and have it roasted to the time where they're feasting and they're having fun. They're partying without him. But even more of a shock to him was when he found out who was the guest of honor. What is the occasion? It's his brother. Now, we don't know how long the brother was missing, but I suspect it may have been several years because he had, I think, quite an inheritance, and it took him a while. He was loved by all where he went to that distant land till his money ran out. It took time to squander all that. We can understand, can't we, how the older brother felt, oh, the injustice of it all. Have you ever been unjustly treated? 
I'm sure whether you have or not, you certainly have felt like you were because that's a common malady. We tend to look at things always from our point of view, our perspective. Here's where in the story we see how it relates to our earlier instruction to forget what's behind in the past. In verse 29 and 30 that we just read, it reveals that the faithful son has a short list of grievances. Evidently, some other things have been bothering him all of his... Do you ever act that way? Do you let your mind run and you can't shut it off? And you're always saying, why me? Well, evidently, the older son has had some grievances probably in his mind as he had been out over the years slaving away. Notice that word. That's pretty emphatic. He didn't say, I've just been working for you. He says, I've been slaving away all these years. And Look at how we use the word never. You ever get in an argument with your spouse? Surely none of you ever have. But we use these words ever, never, always. You always do it that way. You never listen to me. How many times have I told you you just never, those type of words that he's using, I've never disobeyed you, Father. And now he has a third complaint to add. He says, you've never thrown even a small party for me. You've never even killed a goat or slain a goat, let alone the precious fattened calf, which was preserved for a very big celebration, something really special. Perhaps when somebody they were into honor showed up to visit. You've never even given me a young goat. The 30th verse may even imply an attitude that the older brother has been harboring for some time, as I said. He may have had these thoughts while he was out in the field. If that brother's been gone now, and he knows that he got all of his inheritance. He took it early, and he went away. And the brother doesn't really know what's going on, but the brother's out there thinking, while I'm diligently here slaving away, my younger brother's having the time of his life. He's indulging himself with partying and food and drink and all kinds of pleasure, and perhaps the older, diligent son even thought to himself, I envy him. I wish it were me. Surely not. Surely this diligent son never had a thought like that. Have you ever looked at someone who is living a sinful life or doing pleasures you're not participating in and you've thought, oh, if only I could do that way. If only I could live that free. Most of you, if you're honest, would probably say, I remember feeling that way. I remember envying those people who were free to do as they please. Now, we don't know that that older son thought that, but if he was human, and he was, I suspect that he certainly did have those thoughts because that's how the human spirit works. In the battlefield of our mind, these obstacles that hold us back or that get in our way, that hinders a believer, is taking our eyes off the goal or the prize. We start looking at others. Our race is impeded when we look around at others. Now, keep your finger, or perhaps mark Luke 15, and you might want to turn back to a a second passage. Psalm 73. I'm going to show you, and I'm going to skip. I'm not going to read all of this. I'm going to read some of the main points of it. But here's another man. His name is Asap. Not all the Psalms were written by King David, but Asap is writing the Psalm. It tells us that right at the beginning. Some we don't even know who the author is, but it says Psalm 73 is a Psalm of Asap. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. He recognizes the God of Israel. He's good to those who are pure in heart. But he's soon going to reveal that he himself is not pure in heart because he starts off verse 2 and he says, But as for me, surely Israel is pure of heart for those who are pure of heart. But as for me, my feet almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Did you get that? The writer of this psalm is being so honest. He's brutally honest about a struggle that he had, and he's going to tell us some more details in just a moment, that nearly caused him to lose his footing, to lose his way. You get a visual picture of a mountain goat on a little tiny trail with loose rocks and things up there ready to lose his foot and slip off the cliff. And that's how he perceived it with his relationship with God. He says, as for me, my foot nearly slipped and lost my foothold. 
to lose your foothold does mean that you have a resulting fall. What was the cause of his peril or his danger? It was that he looked around at others, others who were arrogant and prosperous, and he envied them. Now, surely none of you have ever envied anyone who is prosperous, right? In verse 5, he says some other things he observed. He talks about these. It looks like in verse 4, they have no struggles. Verse 5 says they're free from the burdens of, that are common to man. It seems like no matter what they do, they don't struggle. Everything they put their hand to is a success. Their appliances don't all break down at once. Their car doesn't go on the fritz. The neighbor kid didn't just throw the baseball through their window. Their crops didn't get moldy and fail. They didn't have robbers come in and steal their livestock. It just seemed like everything they did worked out well. They're free from the common burdens and the normal ills, he goes on to say. Though they are wicked, as he observed them, he says, they appear to be blessed. In verse 9, he talks about their lives. In their lives, they lay claim to heaven. You know, when I read that verse, I thought... These are people who claim to be believers. These are people who claim to be Christians. It says their mouths lay claim to heaven. Perhaps they even think, look, God must love me. He must approve of my lifestyle or I would have bad things happen. Because that's the inverse of what we sometimes think. When something terrible happens, we think, I was serving you, God. Why don't you like me? Why are you punishing me? The inverse is to think because things are going well, I must be okay in God's eyes or he'd be stomping down on me, putting the hammer down. That's not the way things work, though. We can learn a lot from Psalm 73. Verse 10 reveals what perhaps you've observed yourself, that if you have money and power and influence, the people will flock to you. They'll follow after you. That's exactly what happened to the prodigal son. As long as he had money, he had friends. They wanted to come and and party with him, but when the money was dried up and gone, they abandoned him. If you were ever tempted to envy the wicked or even just envy an unbeliever who seems to have it all, then you need to read Psalm 73 over and over till you really get it till you really understand what he's saying. Because this is a common malady to all of us that most believers can struggle with for some time. And it's confronted in this psalm. The ease of an unbeliever's life, while you, the believer, look on, they, you seem to struggle through all these hardships and they do not. That's something common to us. The psalmist is so tempted by the carefree lifestyle of the wicked and the ease with which they accumulate their wealth, that he comes to a really dangerous point in his life. This is like a Christian who's looking at somebody and they're just about tempted to walk away from being a Christian because it's just too much to bear and it's so much easier for the unbelievers. Hopefully none of you have ever thought that, but those thoughts are out there. He almost loses his foothold. And then we read verse 13 in that psalm. This is where I believe it all comes to a head. I believe verse 13 shows you that he almost loses it. He says, Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. He has now come to this point where he's not only envious of the lost but he begins to question whether my whole righteous living is a waste of time. Brothers and sisters in Christ, please don't ever get to that point to where you think, wow, it's so much easier to not believe. It's so much easier not to live under the constraints of God's word, to just go living freely. Well, that might have a lot of freedom for a while. But even this godly man, we assume this, that writes the psalm, he tells us that this was the point where he almost gave up. He begins to question whether he just has been wasting his time and the way he's lived. If you have been living the godly Christian life for many years, don't ever think that you've wasted your time just because you don't see a lot of benefits in the here and the now. 
the psalmist then goes on. This is why you got to read this chapter over and over a few times to really get it. Because the psalmist goes on and he tells us what eventually kept him from abandoning the purity in his life, the Christian living in his life, and joining in the lifestyles of the heathen. Oh, some of you have looked at it and wanted to think about joining the heathen, I know. Because that's common to us. It's a struggle. But in verse 14 and 16, he says, All day long I've been plagued. I've been punished every morning. In verse 16, he says, When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. You can tell he's really struggling. But then verse 17, he finds an answer. And the answer was this, Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed and they are completely swept away. How was it that he came to the realization of what was truth? He came to the sanctuary. The sanctuary is the place where we pray. It's a place where we open God's word and where we talk to God and where we get on our knees and we plead with God and where we listen to God. That sanctuary can be in the privacy of your prayer closet, but it's that place where you meet God and you have it out with Him and you talk to Him honestly. It's where prayers and worship and praise all end up. The wicked, he realized their final destiny and their destruction. But then he also realized the blessing that was his as opposed to that in the world. Verse 26, he says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and he is my portion forever. Are you weak? Are you tired? Are you worn out from being good or from doing good or from living the Christian life or holding fast and waiting for the Lord's return? Whatever it is that floats your boat as a Christian, maybe you get in that dry spot where you just can't continue to go forward and be the person you think God wants you to be and you're ready to throw in the towel. Now, many have done that. Many have been to that place. I hope and pray none of you are at that place today. But the psalmist said, I was confronted. I was almost at that point. My foot almost slipped. I almost fell. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, and he is my portion. He began to focus on the God who was his friend, his redeemer, his Lord, his Savior, the God he could depend on, the God he could go to, the God who is his strength to carry on. This psalmist was struggling because he was almost the younger prodigal son. Do you get the comparison? He was struggling with that. The prodigal gave in. The prodigal goes to his father, Dad, I'm sorry that I've disappointed you, but I've had it. And I want you to just give me my portion so I can go and live. I think I'm old enough to make my own decisions. And I want to do what I want to do. And if you would just give it to me, I'll be on my way. And we're tempted sometimes to do that because the Christian life is a struggle. It's a hardship. God comes by our side silently. We don't always see him. But the adversary comes up and he starts whispering in your ear. Or he starts putting things in front of you that cause you to trip or stumble or fall. Or he brings other people who come in and start whispering how much fun they're having if you just come and join me. The prodigal son gave in. The psalmist Asaph was almost to that point. The older son was faithful. The psalmist and the prodigal, the older brother, also have something in common. Because both of them were questioning. At some point they questioned whether a lifetime of service and obedience is worth it. The older son is saying, is it worthwhile all this slaving I've done for you all these years? You didn't reward me, but you rewarded my brother. Both the older son and the psalmist saw, or they imagined at least, the pleasures of living for self. Oh, no one would ever be going over to the dark side once they knew how to follow God if the dark side wasn't pleasurable. Sin has pleasure for a season, but the end thereof is eternal loss. Both of them questioned the ultimate outcome of their lives. 
We've already seen that the psalmist came to realize the truth, but now we want to consider again the prodigal's older brother, the faithful son. In verse 30 of Luke 15, notice that he doesn't even call him my brother. He talks to the father. They're outside now when the party's going on inside, and he says to his dad, he says, this son of yours, this son of yours, he's not even considering him his brother. He's showing contempt. Much of this parable is really directed at the Pharisees for how the Pharisees were looking upon others, especially tax collectors and those they considered sinners. And Jesus was reprimanding them for it. But I think there's so much more that I get from this anyway. Because when I get down to verses 31 and 32, now the father is speaking to this older son. He says, my son. And I suspect he said that with softness and calm and loving words. He said, my son, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and he's now alive. He was lost and he is now found. The parable here shows also the grace and the mercy that's available and awaiting those who repent, isn't it? The backslider, those who approach the Father in humility. But it also serves as a caution to those who are faithful to beware of the temptation to become self-righteous. The older son had a bit of a problem with being self-righteous. Look at me. Look at all my suffering. Sometimes do you ever think, look at me, Lord. Look how I suffer for you. Don't I get something for that? Don't you chalk one up for the pastor or for the Sunday school teacher or the nursery worker? Don't you chalk one up when I didn't punch that guy when I really wanted to? Or when I didn't gossip about the neighbor woman because she gossiped about me? We can become self-righteous and think about all our sacrifices, everything we think we've given up to serve the Father. Besides teaching the Pharisees here, Jesus Uh, was teaching the difference in how God the Father looks upon the wayward son and their attitudes. I believe this parable is consistent with what we know occurs at the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ. The foolish son's behavior has yielded him no rewards or special commendations like the one that's described in 1 Corinthians 3.13. That's where they're at the Bema seat. Whose works have been tried by fire and burned up, but he himself will be saved. Here's the comparison. You remember we talked about a number of weeks ago, I did a little series on the life that God rewards. The life of the believer that God rewards. Imagine that this prodigal son was a believer. And he's one of the ones that walks away and he lives a sinful life and he backslides and there's so many that do that. They haven't really lived for the Lord. And then that passage in 1 Corinthians, it talks about them. Their works will be tried. The believer who's backslidden, their works are tried, and it's all burnt up. Or what they've done for themselves and for pleasing themselves, it's all burned up, but they themselves will be saved. The prodigal son is like that. The prodigal son has burned up all his reward. Everything that was his is inheritance. The father in the parable doesn't say, well, I'm going to give him some more of the inheritance. No, because that half was for the older son. All that I have is yours. But the younger son has come home. He's come in and he's going to be part of the household. He's part of the family. That's like the one who's lost all his rewards. There's going to be great sorrow at the judgment seat of Christ for those who have lost all their rewards. But the diligent ones who serve God And faithfully, down through the years, God will know that. Those are the things that will last. Those are the gold and silver and the precious metals and jewels that will remain after they are tried by fire. Those are the inheritance that will come and be part of it, along with the fact that you are there with the Lord. You are side by side with Him. The foolish son's behavior has yielded him no rewards, 
or any special commendations like the ones we were just talking about. The prodigal had squandered or lost his inheritance, but he returned home to be where the father is. He's still going to be in the family. He's in the home. But the older, the faithful son, he's also with the father and great reward and inheritance for him. It's very secure. He says, everything I have is yours. Not only wealth, but the father is going to give him management over, if I think of this as a big farm operation perhaps back in the day, Jesus is always using farm type of analogies. And he puts him over the farming business. He gives him responsibility. He has entrusted him because he has shown himself to be faithful as his heir. From this story, the things that I learn is that the Father has shown us how to forgive and how to restore relationships. Some of you may have those that you need to work on. The prodigal son has shown us the value of sorrow and the value of repentance and how you can be restored to the family. The older son has shown us how we should not envy the wicked. Like the psalmist, we are not to be short-sighted like the wayward son, and we are to remember God, the Father, is faithful. In Hebrews 6, verse 10, it says this, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love that you have shown him. Hebrews 10.23 says, there is a call to persevere. This is Jesus speaking, or uh, Paul, I'm sorry, in Hebrews, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, there is a call to persevere in the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. God is not unjust. He will not forget your works. We get older. I wonder sometimes how many older people, you can go to the nursing homes or you can meet someone who has, I had an aunt that didn't even know her own family. But yet, and she surely couldn't remember anything good she had done when she was a young person. But I want to tell you, your God never forgets. Maybe you can't remember all the things, but God remembers. It says he even remembers the cup of water given in his name. The conclusion of the matter of the prodigal and the faithful son, is that both of them are found in the father's house. They're in his presence. They're in the household. Now, this is not to be misinterpreted. This is not me saying everyone goes to heaven. I may, I'm making the analogy, these, if they were both believers to begin with, but one became a wayward son. I do not believe all go to heaven. All can go to heaven. God desires them all, but they don't all get there. But the conclusion here is that in itself, it's a tremendous benefit and a reward just to be in the presence of the family of God and in God's family in heaven. But the faithful son, he retains all of his inheritance. What is all? Remember in the communion, I said, just remember that I made this comment from Scripture that God wants you to have all things. He wants to give you all these good things. Well, in Revelation, Jesus' words now, Revelation 2.23, Jesus says, I am he who searches the hearts and the minds, and I will reward each of you according to your deeds. From the mouth of Jesus himself, he says, I will reward all your deeds. It says he searches your hearts and minds. It means he even knows when you are benevolent in your thinking toward people. You don't think the worst, you think the best. When you are gracious in thoughts and attitudes. In verse 26 of Revelation 2, he says, To him who overcomes and who does my will to the end, I will give him authority over the nations. To that faithful son, to that faithful daughter, to the diligent one, just like the older son. If you are diligent and you overcome in this life, and you hold fast to the faith that you believe, and you do the will, you obey God's word, he says, I'm going to one day give you authority. It isn't just the jewels at the Bema seat, I believe, that uh, we have rewards or riches. That's not it. It's not just the crown jewels. I believe when we enter into the millennium, and I've said this before, when we enter into the millennial and the eternal kingdom, that those who are faithful will be given more 
responsibility. It will be an honor to serve our Lord and Savior. He or she who overcomes, he or she who does my will to the end speaks of the one who is faithful. Scriptures are very clear. What we think, what we say, what we do in this life will have an effect on our activities in the next. Let's pray. Father, today we want to just honor you so much because you are a faithful Father. You are a merciful Father and you give us the gift of salvation. But Father, we also know that you've called us to minister, to be part of the church, to do some work here, to be faithful. I pray, Father, right now for anyone who might even be struggling a little bit, like the psalmist, where they're ready to give up. They're ready to go back and join a world who lives for self. And Father, I just pray that you would help that person to act just like the psalmist Asaph when he says, almost, but then I realized the truth and the destiny that that lifestyle can lead to or the loss that can come from it. And Father, today I just pray for each and every person here. If they've become weary of doing good, I pray that you'd strengthen them. May they also be encouraged in their minds and their hearts to understand that you are the one who keeps the records and you know everything that we've done through our life here on earth. And I pray that all those under this roof today might be able to stand before you one day and receive rewards for faithful service, faithful things they've done, for faithful loving acts even of just kindness and forgiveness. And Father, today we just thank you for the way that you are tender and caring to us like the father in the story of the prodigal and that you are always welcoming home anyone who's wandered away that needs to come back. With every head bowed, every eye closed, right now if that speaks to you or your heart, if you've been on the brink, if you've been thinking about wandering away and this message, the Holy Spirit's tugging at your heart and you say, Lord, I know I'm on the verge of slipping. Oh God, I want to recommit my heart to you. If that's your prayer of your heart today, just say, Lord Jesus, help me. Help me to be faithful. I'm not going to ask any of you to get up by your seat or come for prayer for that. You're always welcome to do that if you want. But if there's anyone here, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, is there anyone here that that speaks to you? That you're struggling with looking at others and tempted to chuck the Christian life because of discouragement? Just lift your hand if any of you are struggling with that. We'll pray specially for you. Father, we thank you that you are a good God. I do pray that everyone is encouraged by knowing that you are a Father who rewards and that there is a place called heaven. And there is something coming very soon an event called the rapture that will shock the world. It will shock even those of us that are looking for and expecting it. But Lord, you've promised that that event's going to happen. And we look forward to the day when we can be in your presence. But as long as we have breath and a heartbeat here, Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us for each day that we might serve you in the way that you want us to. Help us not to be discouraged. Help us not to look at the past. Help us to focus on the future and what's in front of us and be faithful. And Father, today as we go to the fellowship dinner, we just pray that you would bless the food, nourish our bodies with it. I pray, Father, that you might help us to uh, be encouraged by the fellowship around the